Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to this first webinar of the Wood Solutions webinar series. So each week on Tuesday at 11am you can expect a webinar from us on a wide range of topics on timber construction. In today's webinar we're going to be covering an introduction to cost management for mid-rise timber projects. So this will be presented by Lawrence Ritchie who is the cost and program estimator with the mid-rise advisory program. Uh, my name is Adam Jones, I'm a structural engineer with the Mid-Rise Advisory Partnership as well and I am the host of the Wood Solutions Timber Talks podcast. So if you haven't heard about Wood Solutions before, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about what we do. So we're funded by Forest Wood Products Australia, we are a not-for-profit and basically we exist to help uh, everyone listening on this webinar right now to go out there and design and build in timber. So the way we do that is we've got a wide range of resources. Uh, most famously probably is the Wood Solutions Technical Design Guide. So right now we've got 51 of them and they range from topics from structural engineering to architecture, to cost management, to detailing, to durability. So any of your questions you've probably got uh, will be able to be answered within these guides. We've also got Wood Solutions Campus. So right now is probably a good time to go out and upskill if you find you've got a bit of time up your sleeve. So all the courses on Wood Solutions Campus are free. And at the bottom here, the, the team I'm part of and same with Lawrence is the Mid-Rise Advisory Partnership. So we've got all the partners you can see on the bottom of the screen here. And we exist to give free technical support to real Mid-Rise projects. So say if you've got a, a project that uh, is currently documented in concrete, and you're interested to see what the timber solution might look like. We've got a costing engineer, a structural engineer, uh, a fire expert, a uh, uh, architect on the team. So we can go from different angles and comment on the feasibility about your project. So feel free to get in touch with myself if you want, uh, want us to look at some of your projects. So this is some of the functions that you can see using Zoom webinars. So on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, you've got the chat function and the bottom right hand side of the screen here, you got the Q&A. So with the chat function, I recommend everybody feel free to introduce yourself and ask some of the questions if you like here. And there's a lot of experienced people who are attending this webinar, not just the people who are panelists and presenters. So feel free to have a robust discussion in the chat. Or at the end of the, the, the session, we'll be going through the Q&A uh, with the two presenters, or Lawrence Ritchie who's the presenter and the panelist, Paolo Levici. You've also got the ability to upvote the questions that you think are most relevant and the questions that you like the most. So this is a webinar series. So today is the first one. We're gonna have Lawrence Ritchie presenting and Paolo Levici as the contributing panelist member. Next week's webinar, uh, Tuesday at 11 a.m., we're going to have uh, design optimization using parametric design with Richard Maddock. So this is a very interesting topic as well. As you can see here, parametric design and structural optimization can get some really interesting uh, architectural solutions. So this is the Maggie's Cancer Centre out in England. And using all the exciting, innovative, cutting edge technologies like Grasshopper and talking about how it speaks to uh, robotics and uh, prefabrication techniques and so forth. So make sure you stay tuned and sign up for that, which I'll be sharing with uh, some links after this webinar. So here's a little teaser for upcoming topics, uh, building in a bushfire prone area, a range of case studies, sustainability topics, uh, more structural engineering topics and so forth. So there has been a few questions already asked from Carol, Robert and uh, Jacinta regarding the CPD forms. So this is a formal CPD event. So if you were tuning in for our previous webinars, they were informal CPD. This is different in that it is formal, meaning we're going to give you three questions and you're going to answer three questions for your uh, to achieve this formal CPD. And we're going to send you a survey monkey after this with these three questions and also give you the ability to download the form yourself. So this is the form that you'll get on the left hand side of the screen and you can fill out yourself and this will be your formal CPD certificate. So I hope I answered that properly. Uh, Jacinta, Carol and Robert, but if not, please let me know in the chat and I'll uh, go through it again at the end of this webinar. Okay, without any further ado, we'll get into the first 
part of this webinar, which is uh, Lawrence, Rinci Lawrence Ritchie presenting. So Lawrence has a master's degree in construction management, experience in tier one construction, and over a decade working in the property sector. Drawing on the holistic understanding, Lawrence engages in project evaluation and design optimization services, ultimately requiring the estimation of construction program and costs. With a keen eye for detail and a passion for innovation in construction, Lawrence sees the opportunity for timber systems to change the way we build for the better. G'day everyone, thank you very much for coming along. Um, and thank you, Adam, for the, the kind introduction. Um, as Adam suggested, my name is Lawrence Ritchie. I work as part of the Midrise Advisory Program um, as a cost and program estimator. Um, and we have a, an interesting role, um, which is purely advisory. So um, we don't charge for anything we do. Um, we're, we're funded by the industry and then partially by the government under a voluntary matching scheme. <laughs> and um, it basically, we can support you in any of your projects, um, whether it is in the realms of costing, which of course we're talking about today, structural engineering or any of those other areas, as Adam was saying. So today we're talking about a sort of an introduction to cost management for mid-rise timber projects. Um, now, the, the important word here is introduction, of course, um, because this is uh, the first presentation of what is expected to be a series. We're going to touch on a number of different topics. Um, relatively lightly, given the time frame that's available, and then uh, we'll delve a little bit further into those um, in, in future webinars. So we're gonna start off with a, a bit of context about what we're talking about and, and why it's relevant to the, uh, the industry today. Uh, we're gonna look at our cost engineering guide, which as Adam um, briefly mentioned, is a recent technical design guide, uh, which was launched last year. Um, touch on a system, which is the system, I should say, which is a really important part of all of this, in my opinion, and uh, obviously we'll conclude. So, um, as a bit of an introduction, in 2016, uh, in case you're not aware, uh, the National Construction Code changed to allow um, timber structural systems in buildings up to a, an effective height of 25 metres. So it's about eight storeys in height. And you can see in the little graphic here, it's really what we classify as mid-rise, that four to eight storey space. Um, in 2016, that was classes two, three, and five. Um, so that's typically apartments, hotels, and offices. And in 2019, these provisions were expanded to all building classes. So you can build any of these um, typical buildings, whether it's a hospital or a school, uh, an aged care home, as a deemed to satisfy solution under the National Construction Code. Since that time, um, we've seen, uh, oh, sorry. Let's try again. Since that time, we've seen uh, a lot of growth in this area. We've seen some amazing mid-rise projects coming through. Um, the first project which actually occurred in the mid-rise timber project, which occurred um, with, uh, I suppose, contemporary construction systems, is the one on the left-hand side here, Forte, and that was built back, built back in 2012 to 13. Um, and then since uh, then, we moved on to um, a, a few others, and more recently, a um, uh, couple of the, the other buildings sort of towards right-hand side here have been completed. So you might be most interested um, if you're based in Victoria, um, in say 55 South Bank, which is that um, central project in, and down the bottom. Um, maybe if you're up in New South Wales, there's, uh, um, well, there's quite a few projects in New South Wales, but AVO Aged Care, which is up on the top right-hand side, uh, it's a, a I think a nine story, maybe it's a 10 story um, aged care uh, home built out of um, timber systems. We've also seen a lot of projects uh, proceed in the office space. And these are just a few which um, we've seen over the years and we, we continue to see under construction at the moment. Um, we can talk about these in a bit more depth uh, at a later date or if you want to contact us directly, of course, we can always talk about them then. The uniting factor in all these projects, of course, is that the main structural product used is timber. Um, and these are typically the, the main timber um, products which we see used in the uh, completion of these buildings. There are other products I really need to specify around the world which are utilised. I know in, in North America, there's uh, nail laminated timber and dowel laminated timber. Uh, there's uh, quite a few more in Europe. Um, but these are typically what we see used the most in our market in Australia. Uh, we can really group these into two different categories. Um, the one in the darker circle, um, we would classify as lightweight systems. And that's really everything which you might see if you go out to a growth suburb, you know, it's really, really common for us to build our houses um, out of um, lightweight systems with stud framing um, and uh, lightweight um, trust floors or roofs. And then the other option is in those lighter circles, what we would classify as massive timber. 
Uh, and as you can see, those products we typically see in that category are glue lam or glue laminated timber, um, cross laminated timber, LCLT, and laminated veneer lumber or LVL. So we'll go into those just in a little bit more depth just so we can see how they, they relate to the mid-rise space. So lightweight framing. Um, this, this may surprise some people, but lightweight framing is actually a really good, efficient solution to mid-rise um, apartment or, or sort of cellular construction. Um, you can see here, this is a, a beautiful project completed out in Melbourne's West, um, which, uh, it, as you can see, is five stories in height, and it was built um, using stud framing. Um, the really simple thing around stud framing, the amazing thing about stud framing is that studs can come in different grades and of course in different sizes as well. So as the loads increase in a project, you can simply just increase the grade of the timber you're using in the stud, um, whether that be an MGP 10 up to 12 or then even up to 15, or you can even take it to LVL studs and uh, you can deliver um, obviously a beautiful high quality outcome like this. Um, CLT or cross laminated timber, um, you, you, likely to have heard of before. It's uh, been a bit of a buzzword, especially on grand designs. Um, and basically, uh, this is a product which uh, is made out of layers of timber, or, or uh, we actually call them lamella of timber. And you can see in the little diagram in the uh, black circle here, um, sort of how it looks. And the idea is that each layer runs perpendicular to the one either side of it. Uh, they're all glued together and pressed together, and that creates a solid wood panel. Uh, which can then be used as a two-way slab for a floor. Uh, it can be used as a shear wall. It can be used as a wall for other purposes as well. Um, and it's generally a very effective panelised product. Uh, so you can see here, this is a, a beautiful project um, from uh, down in Victoria, uh, Melbourne's southeast, down in Frankston, um, which is a student accommodation project for um, Monash University. Laminated veneer lumber is another one of these massive timber products. Uh, but the interesting thing about LVL is that it can also be cut down to be considered to be a lightweight product, like a stud. So um, the way LVL is produced is um, it's made out of veneers, as you may expect from the name, uh, which are three to four mil thick um, layers of uh, timber, which are actually peeled, rotary peeled from a tree. Um, and what that means is that you can align all of those veneers so the grain is going in the same direction. Um, you can glue them and press them together and that creates an incredibly strong um, structural element, uh, particularly when you're going parallel to the grain. So as an axial load, as we can see with this, um, uh, with this column just here, which is really a mega column. Um, with the LVL produced in Australia, um, we know that the compressive strength parallel to the grain uh, is typically between 47 and 51 MPA, um, which is uh, quite amazing when you consider that high strength concrete is considered to start at 50 MPA, um, where essentially, you know, we've got this great natural renewable resource of high strength timber. Um, so it's a, a really, really interesting product and obviously pot pot potentially very efficient um, on your project given the design. And finally, for the massive timber system, uh, or the, uh, massive timber products, we've got glue lam or glue laminated timber. So this product kind of draws a little bit from LVR and a little bit from CLT in that it's made out of solid pieces of wood, not veneers, similar to CLT, but like LVL, all the grain goes in the same direction. Um, so what we typically see with glue lam is that it is best to use as a column or a beam. Um, you can sometimes um, use glue lam as a floor panel or as a wall panel if you can uh, make it a, a wide enough um, beam or a wide enough element. Um, but of course, that's subject to your design and subject to your supplier's abilities. Um, and as you can see, you can create these really beautiful high span um, open floor plan environments. And um, yeah, we, we've seen that really take off around the country. Um, in, in the form of office developments, but then also education, as you can see here. This is at RMIT University in Melbourne. And finally, so we've talked about timber for everything so far, but it's really important to know that you can build composite structures. Uh, composite structures have been shown to be um, really effective where they're needed uh, around the world. I know in the UK, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of work done with steel framing and CLT floors. Um, and we have seen that in Melbourne, in Australia as well, where we've got this great six-storey vertical extension, uh, which is this bit here, 
um, over an existing office building in a really, really busy um, part of Melbourne's CBD. Um, there's the main tram terminus here. There's a big train station just over here. This is the corner of Flinders and, and uh, Elizabeth to anyone from Victoria. Um, and uh, there would be tens of tens of thousands of people who walk past this every day. So it's um, it was very important in this solution that uh, the project was delivered um, as um, quickly as possible, then, but then also without uh, as much disruption as possible. Now, all of these systems kind of come together, um, uh, you know, especially where we're talking about the timber systems. They're all made of timber. They all behave in very similar ways in different temperatures and moisture levels. Um, so they can work really well as a, a composite of timber timber. Um, and if you're interested to learn a bit more about that or a bit more about the, the products specifically, I recommend having a look at our technical design guide 46. Um, which, as Adam was saying, was available for free um, from our website as part of the, the full suite of which all guides are available for free. So on that note, let's jump into the cost engineering guide and look at some costing in a bit more detail. Um, so firstly, as I was saying, we do have this, this wide range of guides um, which cover everything from durability through to fire through to acoustics. And then, of course, we've got a few on costing as well. So these are our, our three guides which are specific to costing. Um, 26 and 27 were completed a couple of years ago and updated um, uh, 2018 and then 2019 as well. And um, they basically provide a direct cost comparison between a concrete building and a timber building, um, which delivers the same design, essentially. Um, really interesting guys to go and have a look at. We didn't do them. I, I didn't do them personally. I actually wasn't at Wood Solutions when they were done. But they... Um, were actually completed by a quantity surveyor up in Sydney who also uh, works in Melbourne called MBM. Um, and of course, we, we gave them the designs and they went off and did their thing. So we're, we're quite comfortable that they are um, quite, uh, I suppose, credible. Technical Design Guide 51 is uh, the one, of course, that we're looking at today. Um, we have completed this uh, over the last year, year and a half or so. Uh, and we launched it um, in the sort of towards the end of last year. Um, and of course, these are all available for free to download. Uh, Tech Design Guide 51 um, covers these main areas um, and we're just going to touch on each of these quickly as part of this presentation. And then, as I said, we'll um, uh, go into a, a bit more depth on the, uh, some of these topics um, in, the, in the next couple of months uh, as a standalone webinar or on its own. So if you do have really detailed questions, of course, we're happy to look at them today. Um, I suspect there might not be time, but if there is, that's great. Um, but uh, if, uh, if we don't have time today, of course, we're happy to answer them later um, or as one of these major, these uh, more direct, detailed seminars on these topics. So um, the guide finishes with an appendix, uh, which is actually on the execution of timber structures or uh, I should say the installation of timber structures. So this can be really helpful for a quantity surveyor or anyone who has to go out and do an inspection on a mid-rise timber construction site. Um, or anyone involved in the actual construction of the, the building uh, because it co covers details like um, how you control for moisture, uh, the tolerances you should be looking for, um, the types of connection and the right way for them to be completed. And it's generally a, a useful resource uh, for you to consider um, during your inspections or during your construction. The guide itself is actually informed by this database of 26 um, mid-rise or, or tall timber projects from around the world. Um, a large chunk of these are from the Australian market. Uh, I'd say the majority are actually from the Australian market. Um, but then we have also um, gone out, we worked with our, our friends overseas um, to source information about projects um, in really comparable markets to Australia. So the UK, um, Canada, um, there's a couple of Lendley sites from the US on here as well. And um, yeah, basically these numbers have been used to sort of help inform the advice that we're giving in this guide um, and to help sort of complement our previous experiences as well. So it's well worth coming back and having a look at this in the guide itself. So moving on through the guide, the next section that we should look at is actually estimating. Now this is really a, a very important section, obviously for, for anyone involved in a timber project, um, because it's where a lot of the questions come from, you know, especially the question of, is it cheaper? Is it more expensive? Um, and there's a lot that we have to consider in this section. As you can see, we've got really eight major topics here, um, which we could probably spend an hour on each on its own. Uh, so we're gonna to touch on them very, very quickly here, and we can come back with questions a bit later on. You'll notice I've made a different color for the prelims, labor, and program on the right-hand side. And that's because they're kind of grouped. They, they are individual in, the, on, in their own right. Um, they do all affect each other 
um, for sure. So it's uh, that we'll sort of touch on those together. And then, of course, there's the hot topics, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, of acoustics and fire. Uh, of course, we, we fill these questions a lot. We, we answer them a lot, um, but we do find there's a lot of questions out in the industry. So we're more than happy to provide a bit more information on that. But we're going to come back to this because that is a lot of information um, and I want to cover, cover off on the rest of the guide quickly before we come back to the estimating. So the next section of the guide is looking at procurement. Um, now, you, you may hopefully you understand uh, most of these forms of procurement typically, uh, whether we're looking at a traditional lump sum contract, design and construct or ECI. Um, we typically find that timber construction can work under any of these procure mo uh, procurement models. It's not a problem, no matter which one you choose. Um, but we do find that most of the projects are particularly successful when you have an early contractor involvement. Uh, and really interestingly, taking it a step further and going early supplier involvement. Um, so if you can um, work out um, maybe who your preferred supplier is or, or maybe if there's a, a um, subcontractor who can supply and install, start working with them not nice and early and um, you'll make your experience much easier uh, throughout the delivery process. Um, the guide covers the supply chain and in Australia, as you may well know, um, we have a robust local supply chain. Uh, it's particularly mature in the lightweight space, but also in the mass timber. It's been really quickly growing in the last couple of years and uh, it is now supplying really major projects. Um, but as with every, everything in Australia, we also have quite a large um, um, international supplier um, supply chain. Um, where uh, suppliers, particularly from Europe, um, perhaps the US one day, but particularly from Europe at this stage, and New Zealand, I should say, um, have supplied projects in the market. So it's important to understand the difference between local and international procurement, how it can affect your project um, from a cost point of view, from a risk point of view, um, and obviously from uh, the point of view of the overall project success as well. So it's well worth having a look in the guide and we can obviously have another session on this as well. Risk management. Um, so this is a, an incredibly big topic, um, which I, <laughs> so I've thrown this, uh, this risk assessment method essentially up on the slide as a, almost a placeholder while we, while we talk about the actual um, uh, risk management forms and, and, and how uh, the, the importance of it in timber construction. Um, obviously, there's a, a broad number of different risks that you can be looking at. You could be looking at logistical, you could be looking at quality, whether that's on site or in fabrication, you'd be looking at financial. Um, there, there's just so much you can cover in this. Um, and we typically find that um, if we're looking at quality, uh, the, the timber construction methods are generally um, very, very good but because from a fabrication point of view, everything is fabricated in a factory uh, to millimetre tolerance. Um, to the designs of the architect or the shop drawer. Um, so as long as your designs are right, then they will essentially be cut uh, correctly and then they obviously should be pretty easy to install. Um, on site from a quality point of view, there's obviously a, a, a lot to work on uh, from a moisture management point of view. Uh, depending on your climate, depending on um, the specific site conditions where you are, um, you may be needing to um, treat or protect or, or um, look after your, your timber structure in a different way. Um, so this is something that's really important for cost estimators to consider uh, and for the whole project team, I suppose, to look at. And uh, yeah, it's well worth having a, bit, a look in the guide for a bit more detail there. Design optimization. So this is something which we, um, we engage in on sort of a day-to-day -day basis at Wood Solutions, um, where uh, we will find projects which are designed uh, in timber or, or someone who wants to design a project in timber. Um, but of course, there is always a more optimised way that it can be delivered, uh, which of course has an impact on the cost and the program as well. So what we typically see um, is um, that the most optimised timber solution is a solution where you use the product where it performs best. So for example, we just have a, an example here of say a, a seven storey and an eight storey building. Um, in our little diagram on the left-hand side, you can see those top three floors. We could say that that is built out of stud framing um, very easily. You know, the supply chain can supply that very easily. The products can handle those loads very, very easily. Um, and it's, it's not a problem. It's essentially building a three-story house, which we all know we can do in stud frame. Uh, the next two floors down, um, we're still building with stud frame, but here we're using slightly more robust materials. So rather than just using a, a MGP-10 um, pine 
stud. We're actually starting to look at LVL or laminated veneer lumber studs, which you can get in you know, standard sizes, 90 by 45 or, or bigger or smaller as you need. Um, and we may be looking at doubling up these studs uh, to increase the capacity of that, that structural member. As we get down to the lower couple of floors, we obviously have all of the loads of the building above you um, bearing down on those lower floors. Um, we need to start looking at mass timber products, uh, which can actually handle that capacity. So here we've got a couple of mass LVL panels. We could be looking at CLT. It could be a post and beam design in, uh, in glue lamb. Um, and this is really the most optimised format which we see. Having said that, you know, if it's your first project, you can, of course, look at utilising one structural product the whole way up the building, um, but it may be a little bit less cost competitive than this really optimised version. Uh, we have a quite a large life cycle costing section, uh, which I think is a really interesting area. Um, I won't go really in depth here because, of course, there's a lot of detail, um, but I will touch on really two, two topics which I think are quite interesting. One is carbon credits. Um, so obviously we don't have any legislated carbon credits at this stage, but I think we can all agree it's just a matter of time uh, before they do come through. Of course, when we're building with timber, we're using a product which is actually built out of CO2, essentially. It's, it uh, absorbs CO2 as part of its growth uh, and locks it up in the actual wood uh, in that product for the lifetime of that product. So if you're building a product, uh, if you're sorry, building a building out of a, a, a sequestered carbon essentially product then uh, you're locking up that carbon for the life cycle of the project and there are obviously real potentials for, for carbon credits uh, moving forward the other one is biophilic design um, which you may have heard of if you haven't uh, it essentially refers to the impact of being exposed to natural materials and the natural environment um, on the human body so uh, I'm, I'm sitting well, standing in my office, I should say. I've got a nice wood desk. I'm looking out at the trees. Um, I wish this is a timber structure I'm in, but it's not. Um, and by having these around me, I'm feeling calmer. My heart rate's slower. My blood pressure's a little bit lower. Um, it's just this natural sort of um, intrinsic um, thing which we have as part of the human body. I think you can all agree if you're reading a book, you'd rather be reading a book out in the park in the sun uh, than being stuck in the back room of a library which is badly lit and you know you can only see grey things. So it's a really interesting area and it's a big, big potential opportunity for timber construction. The last section of the technical design guide is a couple of case studies. And this is a really interesting case study which we completed with Ryder Levitt Bucknell, who you may know, they're a big international um, quantity survey and cost management firm. Um, we worked with their Melbourne office to deliver this comparison. Um, we actually, um, so here we took a, uh, the design of a concrete building, um, which was in uh, late design development, sort of stage and we redesigned it in timber and then RLB went off they spoke with the industry um, and they worked out essentially their, their estimate of the project cost and as you can see here we saw a, uh, the timber option coming in at about three percent cheaper uh, this is over an eight-story building um, there is of course there is an opportunity to to find more savings in there uh, we believe and, and I think RLB would agree um, but I think the really important message here is that we can be building these buildings safer we can be building them faster um, and we can be building them for the same price or cheaper uh, which I think is a really important part of this so for a bit more detail of that, I really recommend going and having a look at the guide. Um, of course, we're happy to do a similar sort of thing to this on one of your projects, if you're interested. So let's go back to estimating. Uh, this is, as I said, a big topic, a lot of really important areas. And this is the, the topic which um, really can impact the overall cost of your project. Um, so we spoke a little bit about the products at the start. You understand there's lightweight framing, there's massive timbers being CLT, LVL and um, glue lamb. Um, let's have a bit of a look at the acoustics. So when we're talking about acoustic insulation, there's really two main measures that we look at. Um, one is the airborne uh, sound insulation. The other one is called impact sound insulation. And they refer to it as RW plus CTR, that's airborne, and LNW, that's uh, impact. We typically treat the airborne um, insulation uh, through the addition of mass. So uh, if we have a, a concrete slab, obviously it's a lot of mass. It's a very heavy element. Um, and that actually um, uh, deals with our, uh, our uh, airborne acoustics quite effectively. 
if we're looking at the impact rating, we typically have to add some form of sort of resilience to the system. So that could be in the form of a, an underlay, could be in your flooring choice. If you go for a carpet, that's much better for acoustics than obviously a, a really rigid, you know, hardwood floor or, um, or concrete slab. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's an important thing to consider depending on what sort of class of building you're looking at. This image here is from 25 King. Um, which is a 10-storey post and beam office project up in, uh, in Brisbane, all built out of glue lamp and CLT, as you can see here. Uh, and there's some LVL in there as well, I should say. Um, and in office buildings or class five buildings, there isn't a requirement for acoustic, um, uh, for airborne separation between um, uh, levels, just because I suppose you might have multiple tenancies and it's a flexible arrangement. Still, we, we typically find to achieve a really nice sort of positive outcome for everyone, including the tenants, um, it's really a, an effective solution to uh, batten the floor and essentially just have a raised floor. It also means that you can actually transfer, sorry, you can um, design your, your IT systems and for uh, your, your tenants, it's an easy um, way to sort of reticulate their, their systems through the building. Uh, in a, in a multi-residential situation, um, obviously there's much more stringent requirements um, for, for acoustics uh, and we typically see that there's a bit more attention that has to be paid. Um, so that is typically a build up on top of the floor and sometimes there's a small build up underneath as well as we can see in the graphics on the right hand side here. Um, now both of these graphics, really important to note, both of these graphics have two uh, or they have a pink layer underneath the floor and that's the fire protective lining. Um, whether that's a plasterboard or a promat or some other product, um, it requires a fire protective lining uh, for a deemed to satisfy solution, as we'll see in a second. Um, now, looking at wall systems, um, we can see here um, we've got the timber solution on the right, there's a steel frame solution on the left, which you might typically see in a, a concrete post and slab building, which we do obviously see normally for a, a multi res situation. And you can see these systems are really delivering the same airborne outcome. There's no impact requirements for walls. Typically, there's a couple of circumstances where there are, um, but generally this is the important number when you're looking at your party walls. Um, now, an interesting takeaway here is that where the, the steel frame system is 300 mil in thickness, um, because it has to allow for you know, the big chunky concrete column to go in the middle, the timber system on the right-hand side is actually the structure as well. So that is the, the party wall and the load bearing element holding the, pro the project above um, up. And uh, you can see that system is around about 40 mil thinner than the concrete or the, the steel one. That might not sound like a lot, but when you're dealing with a project which has say 100 apartments, you could have hundreds of meters of this party wall. Uh, and over time, or over an area, that adds up to quite a bit of uh, gross floor area, um, which is, um, money at the end of the day it's just extra market revenue uh, from nowhere essentially for the for the developer so uh, really interesting outcome there um, from a fire point of view um, so there's two different ways we can go down when we're talking about fire uh, this is the deemed to satisfy solution which of course was brought in to the NCC in 2016 and it has four main requirements the first one on the left hand side you can see is that all structural timber must be encapsulated by uh, the required fire, uh, fire protective linings to reach the FRL for that element. So that's that pink layer that I was showing in the, in the acoustic one. So that's all, you can see that's all uh, fire rate, fire rate plasterboard, same here. Uh, that's all that pink layer. And if you want to comply with the deemed to satisfy solution, you must have this. So you can't have pretty exposed columns and pretty beams and pretty, you know, CLT panels, but Obviously, this does work very well when you're doing a stud frame building. So this is a really great solution for, for stud framing. Um, the other three requirements are that you must have sprinklers in your project, which of course is a requirement of mid-rise construction anyway these days. Uh, any insulation in a structural cavity has to be non-combustible, which makes sense. Um, and you need to use um, uh, cavity barriers where they're required under the design. So that's typically, um, where there's an opportunity for fire spread between solar occupancy units um, and you need to maintain, you know, there is a cavity there for some reason, uh, a cavity barrier is required to obviously stop the, frame, the flame from getting through. So that's the, the deemed to satisfy. If we go down the other option, which we call the performance solution, or it used to be called the um, uh, alternative solution, um, we, we can look at it in a slightly different way. If we want to break any of those rules, so if we want to expose the structural timber, um, this is what we'd be looking at. 
And typically this performance solution brings a fire engineer onto the project uh, and they'll obviously produce a fire engineering report which is specific for the design of the project. As part of that report, they'll uh, utilise what's known as the charring rate of the, the timber element, which essentially is just a, a really a natural insulation phenomenon, uh, which happens when large pieces of timber are exposed to, tim uh, exposed to flame. So um, I'm sure everyone has experienced it before, uh, but if you have an open fire at home or if you've ever been camping and you've thrown a log on the fire, if it's a very big log, uh, it might char a little bit on the outside, but there's a chance the fire will even just go out just because, you know, it, it, the log doesn't catch light very easily. It's the exact same concept with mass timber. Um, I mean, obviously, the, we're, we're talking about different species and all these different things, but the, the fundamental concept of charring is the exact same um, system which we're talking about here. So the fire engineer will take that into account and they may allow you to expose timber in your project depending on the design and the risk of the project itself. Um, now we have this really good, um, there's a, a great video on YouTube actually, uh, which is prepared by Fire, uh, sorry, Arup uh, Engineering. Uh, I think it's actually their UK office. Uh, and this uh, really explains this charring um, phenomenon really, really well, I think. Um, I've got a link to it in the presentation, obviously. We'll have this up on our website um, in the next couple of weeks. But also I recommend you just go and you Google, you know, Arup um, char rate, um, you know, but just Arab char rate should do the job <laughs> and um, I'm sure it'll come up. Um, so let's talk about substructure. Um, this shit is really a no-brainer. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. If we're building a building out of concrete, uh, we know concrete weighs about two and a half tonnes per cubic metre or 2.4 tonnes. Um, your average timber species, a softwood timber species, weighs about 500 kilos per cube. So that's about a fifth of the weight of concrete. Um, obviously that means that we're going to have lighter buildings and lighter buildings typically require smaller footings or maybe fewer piles uh, and that can have a really significant impact on the cost of the project, particularly when you're building with um, contaminated soils or if you wanted to build over an existing project in a vertical extension, um, the lightweight of the timber option um, can really have that uh, good value. So it's something that it, you should really be checking for. if, if you have two designs and, and the timber option has the same footings, then there's a, a question mark there because uh, it should be smaller. This is actually a good example of that where um, we were looking at a, a case study again with Ryder Levitt Bucknell, um, Beck Property Group and ProBuild. Uh, we looked at this existing uh, concrete building, which we re redesigned in timber again, and we found that the basement columns typically were about 25% smaller uh, with the timber building. Um, so that's obviously it's the columns, but then also the footings as well. And 25% of those costs is uh, a lot of money and a lot of time in excavation and, and installation of rebar. So it's um, well worth keeping in mind. So the next section is prelims. And this talks about, of course, um, preliminaries, the program and the labour. Um, we'll go through it relatively quickly because it's a very big topic, of course, and uh, we'll come back to it in more detail in another seminar at a later date. So typically what we find uh, uh, the main impacts on your preliminary costs are the shorter program, uh, reduced lifting requirements, smaller workforces on site, um, a safer site, and less tipping and less waste in general. So let's have a look at those. So we typically find timber projects because they are prefabricated, typically, in a warehouse environment, and that's uh, the installation process on site is an installation process. You know, it's assembly. It's not construction. It's just assembly. Um, we typically find these projects do come in quite a bit faster than a comparison in situ concrete project. Um, so here you can see this is from our um, Tech Design Guide 26, I think. Um, the timber option came in about 30% faster, and that's quite common. We've seen that quite a bit in the industry. Um, looking at the cranage, um, so we already know that, that timber solutions are lighter uh, than, than the reinforced concrete solutions. Um, so it makes sense that, you know, we might be looking at reduced cranage just because the, our panels are going to be lighter and our elements are going to be lighter. So if we say our, our maximum panel weight is typically around about two tonnes, it might get a little bit higher than that, um, but normally that's the maximum weight. Throwing a, a heavy tower crane at it, a 50, you know, sorry, a Favco 380D, you know, like a, a big expensive tower crane, isn't really necessary unless you have, you know, access requirements or if you want to lift multiple panels at a time. It's not really uh, a really a. It, it's using a cricket bat to kill a fry to kill a fly essentially. When you could be looking at a small tower, 
um, or even mobiles, depending on your access to the site, or even, and this is quite common in Europe and, and even in the US these days, self-erecting cranes. Uh, we don't really see these in Australia yet, uh, but I think in, in a number of years, as timber construction continues to increase in popularity, um, we'll see a, a number of these uh, popping up around our, our middle suburbs. A good example of this is uh, Alia. This is built in Melbourne's north. It's a five-storey stud frame multi-residential project. And you can see right here, that's uh, a crane, a mobile crane, which is just picking up a floor element uh, and dropping it in on site. This is, as I said, a stud frame, so it's a lightweight solution. And that's actually a floor cassette, which is being picked up by the crane. Um, so with those floor cassettes, they can install a very large area uh, per day. Uh, Moving on from there, uh, so we typically find that, um, and this is from our database and from our experience as well, a, a team will normally install about 94 square metres of project per day. Of course, that'll vary depending on the, the complexity of the design and um, other sort of specific factors to the project. Um, but uh, we can typically say, you know, at a high level pass on a project, we can be looking at about 94 square metres. And that includes everything on it. So if, if you have, say, a post and beam floor plan, um, and say it's 1,000 square metres over five floors, we know that's going to take, uh, you know, about 12 days to build um, because it's about 1,000 square metres. If um, it's, uh, you know, a, a panelised multi-res project like this one in the photo, um, which again was a great mid-rise stud frame project um, in Melbourne, um, again, you know, we just apply that rate, about 94 square metres per day, uh, and... Um, we can, um, yeah, obviously calculate a really high level program. The really interesting thing here, of course, as well, is that the crew to install these elements is quite small. Um, so it really, uh, it's obvious that, you know, these structural systems are, uh, see the crane time as critical path. Um, so obviously, you know, the more cranes or, you know, or you can only go as fast as the crane can lift, essentially. Um, but by that token, you only need enough people to service the crane that you have on the project. Um, you know, all the, all the structural work, I suppose, has kind of been done off site. Um, this is just an installation process. So you'll typically find, you know, six to eight um, people working on site during the structural phase, which is uh, quite incredible when you compare it to uh, other projects. Another good example. Um, so this is a beautiful, beautiful project in the UK. Um, quite a large floor area, as you can see. Big spans, big uh, high open areas. You'd think that this would require more people and more plant and equipment. Um, but it took six workers, um, uh, what is that, I, I, I think it was 10 weeks, 12 weeks to, to install. So it's a really impressive outcome. Um, from a safety point of view, so obviously safety is like number one on every construction site um, around the world, hopefully, but particularly in Australia. Um, and no one really likes to think about it, but there is also a cost side to it. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about the cost of doing things safely, I'm talking about the cost of having someone injured on your site. Uh, if you have an LTI or a lost time injury, um, there is a, a number of sort of unforeseen, unexpected costs which are related with that, which may be, um, you know, making good whatever's been damaged when that injury has occurred, training someone to do that job, obviously paying medical expenses, and all these things add up to be quite a lot. So this is actually a great case study which is done by WorkSafe in Queensland um, a couple of years ago looking at the impact of a, a lost time injury on a lower back injury um, for uh, a, a worker who was obviously jackhammering, um, they found about $8,000 of direct cost to the building owner, um, sorry, to the business owner. Um, but what's really interesting is that, that took what, but, well, almost five days, you can see here, or about $54,000 in revenue to make that money back um, in profit. So, you know, it, it's not just a... a of course, you know, no one wants it to happen anyway from a safety point of view and just from a, an empathetic point of view, but there is also a significant cost attached to it. Uh, and why is that important? Well, so timber. Timber, as we've found and as Lendlease have found on their projects, is incredibly safe to install. Um, on all their projects in Australia so far, at least at, at the last uh, update, um, Lendlease haven't actually experienced a lost time injury in the installation of the structure. Uh, which is incredible. Uh, I, I um, challenge anyone to find a project of this scale where there hasn't been an LTI, um, which isn't timber. 
Uh, from a waste point of view, so of course, you know, this is pretty logical, but if we're producing most of our structural elements off-site in a factory and the on-site process is simply installation, we should have pretty small amounts of um, waste actually being generated in the structural phase on-site. So here's a couple of stats which you might find of interest. Um, Murray Grove, one of really the first mid-rise projects in timber from around the world, um, generated a, a pile of dust every week. Um, now, I, I, I challenge that a little bit. I suspect they probably had some packaging <laughs> as well. But um, certainly, you know, with this amount of waste, they would have been looking at filling a skip every couple of weeks, maybe, you know, in, with, their, with their construction process. Uh, and this has been continued on sites locally as well. So it's, it's not just a one-off project thing. Um, we really need to reassess our tipping costs um, when we're looking at timber projects. This is also really important because when we sort of consider the the... Um, actual cost of tipping waste in, in Australia. You can see here, this is a, a nice chart um, which charts the growth of landfill levies in the various states over the last couple of years. And uh, I think we can all agree there's a pretty steady trend here uh, where those numbers are going up. And I think we, we understand logically that they're going to go up over time anyway, uh, and much more than CPI. Um, so if we can produce less waste in our construction, obviously from a sustainability point of view, it's better, but we also have the, um, the, the financial incentive now as well. So that's the estimating section. We're just gonna have a very quick look at the system. I think we've got one slide here. Um, and this is really what everything is summarized down to and everything that you know, really needs to be remembered um, when you're looking at the estimating of the project. You need to remember that it's going to come in faster, more often than not. Uh, not every project will be faster, uh, depending on its design, depending on its location. Um, but typically, we do find these projects do come in a bit faster than the, uh, the um, comparable project. Your prelims are typically reduced. Uh, of course, once again, subject to your design. But we do typically see reduced prelims uh, in these mid-rise projects. And your footings, this is a, a no doubt one, uh, will absolutely be smaller. Um, so unless you're, I, I don't know, uh, covering all your timber floors with a 120 mil slab of concrete, um, I think we, we can all agree that the timber solution will always be lighter uh, and will always have those benefits being able to build um, as a vertical extension or on those contaminated sites for less. So in conclusion, um, I'd like to take a, a second just to plug our services. So uh, of course we do um, you know, free, completely free advice and support for project teams. Uh, anyone who's interested in building or designing or being involved in a mid-rise timber project, um, our team is really here for you. Um, we're independent, we're completely impartial. Um, we, we just want to see a successful project because, of course, that will lead to more projects in the future. So I recommend um, yeah, getting in touch if you do have a question. And finally, um, of course, where all of our resources are independently written and free to use, um, you have to consider your prelim costs <laughs> and uh, where these timber projects are typically faster, safer and uh, less disruptive than other alternatives. So that's me. Thank you very much. And feel free to take a screenshot of my, uh, my details or um, give us a call or send me an email at any time. Thank you very much for that, Lawrence. That's right. That was great. So I'm going to now move to the Q&A section. So I'll just remind everybody, you can leave your questions in the Q&A section in the Zoom. Uh, and there's a few coming through chat as well, so that's great. So I'd like to introduce Paolo Levici to the panel. So Paolo's extensive experience in developing and using wood products encompasses advisory and hands-on roles in the design and construction of timber structures, project management, research, product development, teaching and training. With a PhD in industrial technologies, wood, Paolo worked in the plywood industry for seven years before starting a wood engineering practice through which he coordinated the design and delivery of multi-storey timber buildings before joining the Wood Solutions Mid-Rise Advisory Program in 2016. Welcome, Paolo. How are you? Hi, thanks. And what about you and all the attendees? Uh, Going very well. So there's yeah, yeah. 200 right now. So there's a few interesting questions that are coming through, yeah. Paolo. I'd like, to start, I'd like to start with a question directed at you, Paolo. Uh, what are some of the limitations in prefabrication and timber construction in context to what Lawrence has been speaking about? Mm, yes. So in terms of limitations, I would say mostly uh, timber is not able to be used in ground contact, in direct ground contact without preservatives, but for 
mid-rise construction is certainly not advisable to think about uh, wood-based foundations, stamps or similar. So the first slab should be uh, off the ground and typically, typically uh, people design for a uh, uh, concrete structure up to level one, incorporating also whatever goes into the ground level, like kitchens and services and plants and everything. And this allows timber to stay off the ground for both termite and uh, moisture related, uh, fungi related durability. Then off the ground, there's no difficulty to design with a good detailing for durability for all this uh, type of biological risks. And our guide number five illustrates the principle of designing for durability with timber uh, quite well. So then uh, another limitation can be the height. Uh, currently, there are projects up to 18, 20 stories which have been built or are being built in timber. Uh, Skidmore, Owing and Merrill are top uh, engineering firms specialized in high rises. They did a full uh, design of a 40 story building, a redesign actually of one of their most successful uh, designs in concrete, a 40 story building in timber and they demonstrated feasibility, full feasibility. Uh, then, of course, uh, if we are thinking about what is possible in terms of cantilevers, for instance, with steel construction, then it's difficult to do the same, exactly the same with uh, timber. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it will lead to very heavy uh, dimension. So it's not meaningful to imitate what you can do with other materials with timber. You need to design for timber and and make the most out of this uh, wonderful and efficient material. Uh, basically, that's it. But on the other hand, timber-based design is much better on uh, difficult sites, as Laura has uh, described so far. Mm. Thanks for that, Paolo. Uh, Lawrence, can you, you can see the Q&A come through. Yeah. At the yep. I might let you just choose the questions that, that you might like to answer, and Paolo, you might like to join in yep. as well. Yep. Um, so, uh, look, there's a couple which I think are important to, to cover off on just quickly, uh, just to make sure that everyone is, uh, is clear on uh, a couple of things in the presentation. Um, there's a question from Chris asking uh, if we can explain what prelim costs are. And I'm sorry, I should have uh, discussed this just quickly or introduced it quickly. Um, preliminary costs are essentially the costs involved in um, delivering a construction project, which aren't um, specifically the materials and things going into the building. So obviously if we're building a, an eight story timber building, the, the timber which is going in isn't a prelim cost, but things like um, uh, say gantry hire or supervision or permits or, um, or all of those, you know, shed hire, toilet hire, um, temporary services, all of that falls under the, the prelim cost um, sort of banner. Uh, and of course, you can imagine they're all very time sensitive. So if we can bring the project in faster, um, you have to pay less, essentially, which is a good outcome. Um, the other one which I just wanted to clarify was that um, from Charles, uh, who's asking if the six to eight people to install 94 square metres per day includes the installation of vertical elements. Um, yes basically. So that is that includes everything which is on top of the floor element um, as well. Uh, so your load bearing system. Um, so now that they're, they're out of the way, um, let's see what else there is. Maybe Nikolai has a question about uh, the um, delivery times. Yes, they are comparable. I mean, mm. not exactly the same. They may not be the same, but this will vary with uh, the level of uh, supply that the same company is engaged with in a certain moment. When they are a bit low in their orders, they may be faster. When they are a bit more, uh, can I say, busy, they may be a take a little longer, mm. both locally or uh, from overseas. Mm. Otherwise, they may be comparable, yes. Yeah. And then another interesting question, uh, which I think, Adam, you will be more uh, um, indicated and asked to answer is from this anonymous about what will be an ideal uh, set of geometries and wall alignment, etc., for a timber structure. Thank you, Paolo. 
Uh, who read that question? I'll, I'll be able to answer it. I can't find it actually, but. Oh, 11.48 AM from Anonymous. Okay. So that's a great question because this is one of the most important things to get a successful timber project because like Lauren said, it can come in cost competitive or less than concrete if designed from a, what we call a timber first paradigm. So designing with the material in mind. So for residential, we recommend a spans of that are under six meters. So you open yourself up to a wide range of products and the floor structure depths are, are similar to that of concrete and very competitive. So when you push past six meters, it's a little bit more difficult. Office buildings, a little bit different. We can get the nine meter spans that you're looking for in office grids um, in the primary direction and secondary direction, actually. Regarding wall alignments, avoid them at all costs, uh, especially on the lower levels. The upper levels, you might be able to get away with, with minor load transfers, but um, you do get punished more in timber buildings than you would for you know, traditional construction. Hmm. Then I will uh, ask everybody to have a look at the last two questions. The, the second last from Rhys uh, is about any project currently in design in Queensland. Yes, there is uh, a few projects, one of them actually under construction, which is a very interesting one that it could follow. We have our colleague Dean Ashton in uh, Brisbane, so he can um, contact Dean and, and go and have a look together as soon as uh, the, the possibility to uh, go around will uh, be open again, but the, the building site is open. Mm. And then the last question that I see from Nick Meister, oh, probably not the last one, Nick Meister, <laughs> a good friend of us, and now the the CLT uh, director at Caterra. So congratulations, Nick. We will be very, very happy to do a, a cost engineering guide for hybrid construction hmm. if you join us as consultant for this. <laughs> yeah, because you are one of the most experts in the world of this. Yeah. And, and then... Uh, Joseph, the Evio uh, traditional, how does traditional developer approach this? Well, that's an interesting question. Mm. Traditional developers, of course, they look at two things, uh, whether it can cost less and be delivered faster, which goes into the same thing, and whether their clients will appreciate better a timber-based construction. Uh, yeah. Normally, they find uh, uh, positive answers to both. Some of them have tested the market, actually. They have tried to promote it as a timber building and found some positive feedback from their clients or tenants. And therefore, this is why they decided they are not charities, so they do it. If they choose timber, they choose it for some good reasons. Mm. Thank you, Paolo. Um and Lawrence, so we're probably going to take one more question. I might let you, Lawrence, choose a choose a question as a final one, and uh, we might <laughs> all jump in um, on the spot. Um, probably, uh, oh, that one's already been answered. Um, you can name a few if you like, Lawrence, and then you you choose if you like. Yeah. Okay. Um, look, I think Mark has an interesting one on uh, penetrations in the lower stories of a, a building. Um, how different that is. I mean, look, I'll talk about it from a cost perspective and then maybe, Adam, you might want to touch on it from a, a structural point of view. Um, so obviously, if, we, if we're building big buildings, the loads on the lower floors can be significant uh, depending on the, uh, the, the structural system you're using and, and the design, of course. From a cost point of view, um, if you need penetrations at lower levels, um, even if it's a variation penetration, um, timber is certainly a much, much better solution than uh, you would find in concrete. Um, just from, from personal experience, um, you know, coring through concrete as a, a variation can be a, a slow, noisy, disruptive, expensive process. Um, whereas if we're going through concrete, sorry, through timber, um, we all know how you can you can cut through a piece of timber pretty easily. It, it can take, you know, depending on the size of the element, it can be a, a bit of an operation, but it is still much faster and safer and quieter than the, uh, the concrete alternative. Um, would you like to maybe touch on um, penetrations, Adam? Uh, I think you covered it pretty well, okay. Lauren. The penetrations with timber, it's like all structural yeah. materials. You just need to work out the load transfer and in that section you take away what whatever's taken out so it's no uh 
engineering in general with timber, it's just structural engineering fundamentals that are similar to concrete mm. and penetra penetrations is no different. Yeah. yeah. There's a good number of other very yeah. good questions. So uh, shall we go on or we can certainly answer these questions individually uh, through the email. Mm. I guess. Yeah. So Adam, what do you suggest? I suggest uh, if anyone's got any burning questions, feel free to uh, leave it as an email to us. So you can go jones at woodsolutions.com.au and I'll pass it on to um, Lawrence or Parlo or I'll answer it myself. So feel free to get in touch with us. Hmm. So I might leave it there with yourself, Lawrence and Parlo. So thank you very much for uh, the presentation and Great. the question day. Thank you, Todd. Well, thank you, thank you very much, guys, everyone. for joining us. Thank you. Okay. So just before everyone goes, I'd like to remind everyone of next week's webinar. Uh, again, it's going to be at 11 a.m. So we've got Richard Maddock, who's the associate of the specialist modeling group at Fosters and Partners, talking about parametric design, design optimization, uh, and how it relates to prefabrication and artificial intelligence even. So this guy's done some extremely interesting projects. As I said at the start, I had um, an interview with him on the Timber Talks podcast recently which was released last week. So there has been a launch for season three of the Timber Talks podcast. So if you haven't listened to this yet, I highly recommend that you subscribe. So it's something you can listen to when you're walk, taking the dog for a walk or uh, going to the gym, which is probably difficult now, but gym in your home gym or any uh, moments like that. So we got Stephen Mitchell talking about sustainability, Rich Matic, as I said, and James Fitzpatrick who's the architect for the award-winning Timber the award-winning seed house project um, in New South Wales. So as a reminder, with CPD, I'll be sending you a, uh, a link to a survey monkey that will have the three questions that are related to this webinar, and you'll be able to fill out the form yourself, and then this will qualify as formal CPD. So as a note for future webinars, that you need to attend the live webinar to be able to be eligible for the formal CPD component. So again, thank you very much, everybody, for your time in attending this morning. I hope you got a lot of value out of this presentation. And I look forward to seeing you in next week's webinar with Richard Maddock on design optimization using parametric design. Thank you very much.